So, um, so, I, so a couple of you have asked um, I, the biggest question I've gotten um, is whether or not I've seen penguins in, uh, in Antarctica. In fact, uh, yeah, a couple, only the big ones, the, uh, the emperor penguins. Although, um, in general, of course, there isn't very much wildlife in Antarctica, at least on the continent, aside from penguins. And there are these birds, um, they're sort of like big um, pigeons. Pigeon gullum? Yeah, they're sort of like big pigeons. And they're called skuas. Skua. Skua. And, um, and I showed you that picture of our tent, our camp, Nuspola, the, um, yes, the, the place called Taylor Dome with that tent, Pompalaka. And one day, and this was about 200 kilometers from the closest base, and um, one day this skua just showed up. At our at our base, well, it had gotten lost somehow, and we were the only thing in Antarctica for several hundred kilometers. So it landed on top of our tent, and it sat there for a little while, and then it flew off. Who knows where? Um, but in general, of course, there isn't too much um, wildlife in Antarctica. Um, so today I'm, I'm going to discuss the cosmic microwave background and I realize again that this is largely familiar to you so I'll, I'll go through it hopefully fairly quickly um, but since it's such a big part of the science that goes on at the South Pole I have to say something about it particularly in Antarctica and of course the reason why um, the South Pole is such a good place to do this sort of science is because the relative humidity which in a place like Nova Sibiris on a typical day we'll see tonight at Vlajnus must be something like 70%, I don't know, 80% in Antarctica it's, or at least at the South Pole it's 0.03% average humidity. It's actually drier in at the South Pole than at Sahara Desert um, because all of the, it's so cold that all of the moisture, the dew point is very low, all of the moisture has condensed out of the atmosphere. And because of that, there's very little interference from water vapor. So you have a very clear view of the sky. The other place which, which is comparable is on the, um, in the upper Andean plains in, uh, in Chile. So there is an astronomical observatory uh, in Chile which also is a site that has very low uh, relative humidity. But this is, this, is, uh, this is the main reason. And this, this is the absorption curve. Um, You'll often hear about um, science in Antarctica, which is done at submicron wavelengths. So submicron wavelengths take advantage of the fact that the absorption, uh, this is inverse meters, and of course, you know, this is, this is mostly a gas. Um, the absorption uh, essentially is negligible at these sorts of wavelengths. So it's a very good place to do this sort of this sort of astronomy. Okay, um, so just a couple of words about relative scale um, for those of you who are you're probably familiar with this, but of course the standard unit scale in Astrophysics is the parsec, 
The Milky Way has a typical uh, diameter of something like 40 kiloparsecs. The distance between the Milky Way and the nearest big spiral galaxy, which of course is Andromeda, is about 1,000 megaparsecs. So it's sorry, 1,000 kiloparsecs. It's one megaparsec between the Milky Way and uh, Andromeda. And the, uh, the distance between where we are now and the edge of the observable universe, well, what is that distance? Well, what you can do is you can, let's see, if you wanted to figure out how, how far it is to the edge of the visible universe, what you would do is you'd say that, well, the universe we know is about 13.7 billion years old, so the edge of the visible universe must be something like 13.7 billion light years. And how do I know that's right? I know that's right because the biggest natural history museum in America, so this is the equivalent of, I guess, the Darwin Museum in Moscow, the biggest natural history museum in America, in New York City, has a large planetarium, and in that planetarium, there is a big placard. So, and the big placard says, in our 13 billion year old universe, the cosmic horizon is 13 billion light years away. And, of course, that would be true if the Hubble constant was equal to zero. But the Hubble constant is not equal to zero. And, of course, the universe expands. So, even though lots of people walk past here and look at it and think to themselves, well, it makes sense that the edge of the visible universe must be 13 billion light years. Of course, that isn't true because of cosmic expansion. And actually, the edge of the visible universe is, um, is more like, so the visible universe has a radius of something like 13 uh, billion um, 13 uh, billion parsecs. So 13 gigaparsecs. So it's about three times bigger than what you would expect just based on this argument because of the fact that there's been this Shudania, uh, Shudania, history. Um, and you might think, of course, and we'll talk about expansion as well. Remember that there are, in principle, two universes that we discuss. There's the visible universe, and the visible universe can be thought of as a little bubble. And that visible universe is growing at a speed of getting larger, um, the velocity of light. And the visible universe is, of course, embedded in the big universe. And the big universe, we believe, is infinite in extent. So there's a visible universe, which is what we can see, and that's embedded in the, the full universe. Now, one of the things that we'll talk about, of course, is that since the Hubble constant is not zero, the Hubble constant is something like 69 um, kilometers per second per megaparsec, uh, because of the fact that the Hubble constant is um, non-zero, that means, in principle, that there are points that are some distance away from the Earth, which are moving away from the Earth with a velocity which is greater than the velocity of light. So I can just figure out what value of distance I need such that the separation, this separation velocity is greater than 3 times 10 to the 5th kilometers per second. It's not a very hard exercise. 
And that number is going to be something like, you can do the math yourself, it's going to be something like uh, 3 gigaparsecs. So in principle, three gig at a distance of 3 gigaparsecs, sources are moving away from us with a velocity greater than the velocity of light. Does that mean that we can't see them? No, it doesn't. In fact, we can still see them because photons that are emitted from those sources can, in effect, crawl back to us and get inside our visible horizon. It's a little bit of a paradox. But it does not mean that we can't see past the bigger parsecs. Clearly, clearly we can. Okay, so that's, those are the, those are the scales that we'll, that we'll talk about. And this, of course, is a picture that you've seen before, um, and I won't, I won't belabor it, but this is the history of the universe. That's all you need up here is, is where we are. And the, um, the features of this plot are summarized here. So, of course, as time goes on, the, um, the temperature uh, decreases, and little by little, uh, at various epochs, uh, different particles decouple from the primordial soup, as it's called. So, for instance, at a temperature of about 1 MeV, neutrinos decouple. Why is it 1 MeV? Well, it's 1 MeV because at an energy which is greater than 1 MeV, I can have, this goes both ways. So, at a temperature break, because the mass difference between the proton and the neutron is about 1 MeV. So at a temperature greater than 1 MeV, this goes both ways, but once I get below 1 MeV, I get decoupling, and then the neutrinos start to restring. And we know now that there are something like uh, 330 neutrinos that decouple at this point, at this point, per cubic centimeter of every space. So in my body, in the volume of my body, there are something like five million neutrinos left over from neutrino decoupling. And again, they permeate all of space. All right, so let's see. All right, now I mentioned this, um, this famous museum where there is this placard which has still been sitting there for the last however many years. And uh, there are two things that are famous about this museum. The first is that it is the biggest natural history museum in America. The other is that it's the starting point of the biggest parade in America as well. So you know that in America we have this uh, this very famous holiday called Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving. Let's look at this. Dien. Excuse me. Dien Ah, Dien So we have this famous Dien Blagadarenia where families get together and we express thanks for the fact that we were able to subjugate the Native Americans and take over the continent, good for us. And um, at, that, at that day, the famous thing to do, what you do is that when you get together with your family, you turn on the television and you watch the Thanksgiving Day Parade. Have you ever seen, have you seen pictures of this? Oh, I should have shown you this. Um, so in the Thanksgiving Day Parade, they have these huge balloons of American cartoon ca characters. So there's a huge balloon of Mickey Mouse, and there's a huge balloon of the Power Rangers, and there's a huge balloon of all of the cartoon characters that America has unfortunately inflicted upon the rest of the world. And the, the parade starts here, and it goes down, uh, goes down uh, Central Park West, this museum is also famous because there was this movie that probably many, many of you saw 
uh, called Night of the Museum, and it takes place at the same museum as this placard a few years in. And in fact, this year, I had never been to this parade, but this year we went to New York City uh, with my, my daughters, we went to the parade, and not only do they have cartoon characters, but they also have very old rock and roll stars. And I was amazed that this year, this year, they had this, you know who this band is? This American band called Kiss? Yes. So Kiss, these guys are almost 70 years old, and what they do now is they show up in a parade with big cartoon characters. This is what life comes to. So, this is another part of of, uh, of the folklore of the American Museum of Natural History. Okay, so I'll go through this quickly. Um, the Einstein model you're familiar with. Einstein's model is that all of the, is a static model. He needs something to hold it up. How does he do that? Well, he invents this, this cosmological constant and the idea of the cosmological constant. So you know, for instance, that we can write an equation of state or standard gas, so P V equals M V Q. So P is uh, proportional to rho KT. So we put gas in a box, and we have positive pressure, and we have Positive density. Positive density leads to positive pressure. And again, this is called an equation of state. In general, an equation of state is any function of uh, pressure, volume, and temperature. So, that equals zero. so the equation of state here would be PV minus NKT equals zero. So this is, this is the equation of state for standard matter. What Einstein did was he invented this term lambda such that the density uh, is equal to rho plus some term lambda, but the pressure p prime is equal to p minus lambda. So this cosmological constant has the odd property that it has. Uh, positive energy density and negative pressure. And of course, this is the cosmological constant that holds up his static universe. Otherwise, the static universe collapses. Um, okay, and of course, what Einstein didn't realize was that the universe was expanding, and very famously, this idea is um, encapsulated in Olber's paradox. So Olber's paradox is, in a static universe, you should be able to, the night sky should be infinitely bright because there should be a line that goes to every, every, every point, every line you can draw will ultimately terminate in a star. So the universe, so the star should, the night sky should be infinitely bright. The resolution, of course, is that there's expansion. So, we talked about this. So, that, that's the Einstein model. It's sometime around the time of uh, 1915, I believe. And then Edwin Hubble, in 1929, comes along and he makes this very famous diagram where he plots the recession velocity of these things called um, extragalactic nebulae. They didn't realize it at the time, they just knew they were not from the Milky Way. Up until then, or up until probably 1915 or so, or 1920, the entire universe was believed to be just the Milky Way. And then they realized there were these things called extragalactic nebulae that were not part of the Milky Way. And this very famous graph was drawn, you take, and you see that it's not flat, there's a slope to it. And Hubble very famously um, decrees that the universe is expanding. Hubble, by the way, was a interesting guy. He was from uh, Louisville, Kentucky. For those of you who are aficionados of American culture, 
Louisville, Kentucky is where around May 20th of every year they have this famous horse race called the Kentucky Derby. And he spent two years in Britain and evidently he liked Britain so much that he decided that he would start to smoke a pipe and then he developed a British accent which somehow he could not get rid of for the rest of his life. Uh, he claimed that he boxed the French national champion at the time. He also claimed that he had a duel with a uh, German count in his, in his memoirs, which I guess probably died. Um, so he was, a, um, he was a person who was possessed, um, as we say in English, or Latin English, of hubris. I don't know how you say it in Russian, hubris. It was the same word. It's, it's a Latin word, hubris. No, God at this most of it. Um, but he was, he was larger than life somehow. So Hubble makes this very famous um, statement, and of course now we have better map, we have better data, and most recently, as you see, this is a um, a plot which is not flat. So if the Hubble constant at the beginning of the universe were equal to what it is now, 70 kilometers per second per megaparsec, and if that were constant throughout the cosmic history of the universe, this would be entirely flat. But it's not flat. In fact, it has some changing slope, and what that means, of course, since the Hubble constant is the tangent to this curve, what that means is that the rate of the, excel of the expansion of the universe is changing. Again, if it were flat, then we would have constant acceleration, but of course this is what they won the Nobel Prize for uh, a couple of years ago, Kronjöder et al. Okay, so we know that the universe is expanding. One of the and we also know that there is, as you know, there is this, um, this tension, which is also sometimes called the uh, curvature. And there are, and this curvature expresses the tension between the gravitational force, which is tending to uh, essentially implode the universe, and uh, what you might call cosmological constant, or what we now call dark energy, which has this negative pressure. And if these two are exactly balanced, then we say that the overall curvature is equal to zero. If the universe is dominated by gravity, we say that the curvature is less than zero. And if it's dominated by dark energy, we say the overall curvature is greater than zero. Now, one of, the, one of the curiosities is that the, this balance between gravity on the one hand, which tends to produce negative curvature, and dark energy, which goes in the other direction, uh, this balance has to be very finely tuned in order for the universe to have lasted as long as it had. So this is, for instance, in the early universe, this is what the density had to have been one, uh, one nanosecond after the Big Bang in order that the universe would have lasted until our present epoch. So if the, so this is our current epoch, if the universe instead had this value, which you see varies only by the last digit, then it would have been dominated by dark energy and there would have been runaway expansion. If the universe was dominated by gravity, we would have this number, a little bit higher, and the universe would have gone to this, this so-called big crunch. Um, um, and 
So the question is, how, why is it, or how, how was it that this number was, as we say in English, so finely tuned? Well, in Kansas, where I live, um, where there's skepticism about the idea that people came from apes, there's a solution to this, and the solution is called intelligent design, which is also, I don't know if there's a Russian equivalent to this. But intelligent design means, why does this number have its value? Because something intelligent made it that way. Well, it's obviously a religious approach to solving, solving the problem. Um, and in fact, there are, you know, you can go online and you can find lots of examples of how there are all these cosmic parameters that had to be exactly tuned, had to have exactly the right value in order for there to be life on Earth. Well, this is one of them. The proton-neutron mass difference is another one. You move it too high and you don't get, uh, you move it too high and all the hydrogen in stars burns out too fast and you don't get enough stars to sustain life. Um, you move it too low and you don't get deuterium, which moderates uh, stellar, bur stellar burning as well. Um, the distance between the sun and the earth, things like that. And it's all solved by, of course, intelligent design. Okay, it, now, of course, this is also known as the flatness problem. So somehow, the universe converged on a value of curvature about equal to zero, and the way that this is solved is by invoking this idea of inflation, that suddenly, where at one time, the universe grew from the size of a proton, as they say, in the space of 10 to the minus 34th seconds, I think, the size of a proton to the size of a grapefruit. It might be an orange, maybe a mango, but some, some fruit. Uh, and when it did that, of course, the curvature is all flattened out. And, that's, and that, was, that was one of the big virtues of inflationary theory, that it solved the, um, it solved the, uh, the flatness problem. Okay, we'll talk about this. All right, here's uh, curvature, total energy. So, and these, and these, um, oh, sorry, so I said this backwards. This is positive curvature, and that's, yeah, that's right, positive curvature, negative curvature. So the, um, and the, what they correspond to is the total energy greater than zero, equal to zero, and less than zero. And it's the same as if you imagine you're launching a rocket or the escape velocity of something from this little rocket ship. And of course, if the total energy of the rocket ship, potential energy plus kinetic energy is greater than zero, it's unbound. If the potential energy, which is negative, is greater than actually kinetic than kinetic, then it just goes back to Earth. And we somehow are living in this balance between potential and kinetic having exactly the same, same numbers. Okay, total, so total energy less than zero is gravitationally dominated, and that, again, is positive curvature. Okay, uh, all right, so how do you get, how do you get positive curvature, or how do you get curvature equal to zero? We know what the so-called closure density is. There is this, um, we know that is to say exactly how much matter we need to quote unquote close the universe, and the closure density so omega naught is about um, six protons per cubic meter. And we also know that the uh, visible matter in the universe 
corresponds to about 0.5 protons per cubic meter. And where do you get the rest of it? Well, you get contribution from dark matter, which is uh, about 1.5 protons per cubic meter. And you get a contribution from dark energy, which is about 4 protons per cubic meter. And this is what we believe is the composition of the universe. And again, the trick is to actually verify this and measure it in some experiments. So the experiment that you want to do with a cosmic microwave background is to measure literally the curvature, the curvature of, of the universe. So how do you do that? Well, first of all, you have to figure out what you're looking for. So, dark matter, as you know, is something that people have known about for a while. 1929, Hubble makes the statement that the universe is expanding. Only four years later, Zwicky infers that there must be dark matter. 1933, how does he do it? Well, he uses the virial theorem. And what he did was you look at the dispersion of velocities of different galaxies. So if you look at galactic clusters, and you didn't actually um, measure anything other than their, the dispersion of their velocity. And from the burial theorem, you know that for any gravitationally bound system, it must be the case that the magnitude of potential energy is equal to twice the magnitude of kinetic energy. He measured this, essentially, inferred what the potential energy was, and figured out, of course, that there was not enough, there was a deficit of potential energy that was being that, that could be accounted for by luminous matter, and makes this bold statement that there must be this unknown dark matter. Later on, in the 60s and 70s, people do more complicated experiments. They do measurements, Vera Rubin did this series of measurements of uh, rotational curves, and in that case, what she did was she inferred the value of, but she actually inferred the amount of dark matter just by taking a simple model. So for instance, let's imagine that you have a spiral galaxy and you imagine there's a star and the star is rotating with some velocity and you ask what is the expected velocity of the star assuming that all of the matter is contained in a disk. Well, it's a very simple problem that you've solved before. If you just use Gauss's law, mv squared over r is equal to gm m over r squared. So v is equal to uh, gm over r, where this is the mass enclosed up to a radius r. And to do that, you just so this is the integral of g times um, sigma uh, dm, or if you like, sigma uh, times um, 2 pi r dr. So I just integrate over a little um, circular slice. Sigma is the total mass per area, some constant divided by r. And that tells me that if all of the mass is contained in a disk, I expect to get something like a logarithmic rise of the velocity with r up till the limit of my disk, and then it should fall off as, uh, as basically 1 over, 1 over r, just from here. So I should get something just like this. And that's for disk-like structure. If I have a, um, if all the mass is in a sphere, now why would that be? Because I look at the galaxy, 
and I see that the galaxy is a disk. There is, of course, about 1% of the mass of the galaxy, which is the very center in the form of the, um, the um, uh, Sagittarius A star, which is, of course, the, um, the black hole at the center. But if, for instance, all of the mass were in the form of a sphere, then I would just do the same thing, and I would take g is the integral of um, rho times 4 pi r squared dr over r, and now I get something which is going to go as uh, r squared. So a much more a much more rapid rise, but again, once I get to the edge, it's going to fall off as 1 over r. And of course, what they see is something different. What they see is our curves, which extend, they have a very rapid rise, and they extend on and on and on. And the way to explain this is that the universe, is that these galaxies are stuck inside of this large so-called dark matter, you know, these so-called WIMP particles, which make up most of the mass of, in fact, the galaxy. So there's this luminous matter at the center, and then this dark matter bubble, which sits around it. Okay. Now, of course, there are other reasons to believe in, in dark matter. Um, there are reasons from, uh, so here's a rotation curve, from Big Bang nucleosynthesis. Um, we'll talk about the, um, the impact of dark matter on the very famous CMB plot. The other reason, of course, uh, the two other reasons is that um, you need something like a WIMP. So WIMPs are often uh, synonymous with what we call supersymmetry, and because we believe that this, uh, we believe that the, the lowest mass supersymmetric particle is would conveniently make a nice candidate for the missing dark matter particle. And the other reason why you need this is because you have to have some mechanism for stabilizing the Higgs mass. You know, the Higgs couples to mass, uh, so if I imagine can have a radiative correction, here's a TP bar, of course it couples to the, um, it couples to the heaviest, the most massive object, so the dominant radiative correction of the Higgs mass comes from uh, TT bar loops, and if all you did, if all you had was normal matter, then that would make the mass of the Higgs infinite. This would this would diverge. All of the sums over all the particles would give you an infinite, um, which would diverge. The way to get around that is to introduce, for every particle, a supersymmetric particle. So a supersymmetric particle has a spin, which would be, in this case, bosonic. So you spin one, and now you have a loop correction, which is something like Tilda, so this is my supersymmetric top particle. And the contributions from these loop diagrams come in with exactly a negative sign relative to these loop diagrams. So the two of them cancel, and lo and behold, the mass of the Higgs remains finite. So there are lots of reasons to believe in supersymmetry. It's a little bit of a problem that it hasn't been found yet at the LHC. And there are, if you believe in supersymmetry, it's natural to make the lowest mass supersymmetric particle the same particle which accounts for dark matter, which is what most people do. Okay. All right. Um, and in, in fact, of course, people have looked for dark matter particles. Uh, the way that they look for them, for instance, with the ice cube experiment is, and in other experiments, by assuming that if there are supersymmetric particles that have some annihilation rate, so imagine we know that supersymmetric particles or wind particles will feel the force of gravity. So if you look inside the sun, there, if there are, if there's a cluster of um, some sort of supersymmetric particles, or as it's written more generally, chi chi bar. They will annihilate with each other, and when they do, they can produce a detectable neutrino flux. So experiments such as ice cube at the South Pole have used this technique to place limits on the clustering of wind particles or SUSY particles 
in the sun. Now, it depends, of course, on a model. You need some model for the interaction. You don't know whether or not the current, which governs this annihilation, is vector or axial vector. You don't know what the spin properties, Lorentz transformation properties, are of that interaction. So, consequently, you can make some limits, but those limits, and those limits rule out, in fact, some supersymmetric models, but they do depend on some assumption about the, about the couple. Okay, um, now let me make one comment. So in a very, in a very sort of crude sense, we can think of the universe as um, being, as in this competition, this tension between gravity, which is seeking to um, bring things together, and dark energy, which is seeking to push things out. So, if dark energy is expanding the universe, the question is, when the solar system was created, for instance, what was the difference, what was the distance between the Earth and the Sun? Well, we know it's something like 150 million kilometers today. The universe is expanding, what was the distance between the Earth and the Sun at the time that the Earth was created? And the answer is, of course, 150 million kilometers. Well, why is that? That is because we live in a regime. Remember that the average density of the universe is only six proton masses per cubic meter. Clearly, we live in the solar system in a regime where the average density is much, much higher than this. So we live in a region which is obviously dominated by gravitational curvature. And because of that, at least in our little region, the distance between the Earth and the Sun has not changed over time. In fact, you can ask, how far do you have to go before you find the limit of objects that are gravitationally clustered and are not expanding with the rest of the universe and that limit is defined by this, um, our local group. So here's the local group of galaxies. Uh, here is the Milky Way, here's Andromeda. And this local group is, so this local group looks the same now as when it initially formed by gravitational cluster. The in fact, you probably know that um, the Milky Way and Andromeda in five billion years will actually collide with each other. So Andromeda is being pulled by the Milky Way and in five billion years will be eaten by, uh, by the Milky Way. Beyond this, beyond this limit, you feel the effects of cosmic expansion. You feel the effects of dark energy. Out here, the universe is expanding at a rate which is equal to the Hubble constant, which again is something like 69 kilometers per second per megaparsec. To put that into scale, what that means is that if you take a meter stick of space, that meter stick grows by a distance equal to the diameter of a proton in about five minutes. So every five minutes, a meter stick grows by a distance equal to the diameter of a proton. And this is what we mean by cosmic expansion. Okay, now, how do we see the effects of, or how do we, how do we actually measure this curvature? Well, what we can do is, we can do a number of different experiments. Because this curvature literally bends the uh, geodesics, on which um, light travels, we can see the effects in what's called gravitational lensing. So these are, these are probably pictures that you've seen before. And the idea is that if you imagine that you have an observer here on Earth, here we are, and we imagine that there are, for instance, two sources in the sky. And let's imagine that the space between here is flat, so there's some true angle, which I'll call theta true. 
So theta true is the angular separation in the sky that I would measure if the curvature was equal to zero. Okay, now let's suppose I put in between here and here something which has a large amount of gravitational curvature. So I put a big mass here. Okay, now these rays, which previously I could see at an angle theta, now these rays are going to be trapped inside my big mass, inside my big funnel. And the image that I see of these stars is the image that comes from the fact that the rays that I see are the ones that avoid this mass. So if the curvature is dominated by gravity, it's positive curvature, then what I measure is an angular separation, which I'll say theta measured, or this is what I observe, which is greater than theta true. And this corresponds to positive curvature, or gravitational curvature. If, on the other hand, the value that I measure is less, theta measured is less than theta true, then the intervening space is dominated by, essentially, dark energy curvature. It goes the other way. So, the trick is, I want to measure the overall curvature of the universe. I know that here, the curvature is dominated by gravity. How do I know that? Because I live in the local group and everything is bound gravitationally. What I want to do is I want to have two sources that extend out to the very end of the visible universe, or as far as I can go back in time, for which I know the value of theta true. So I need two sources for which I know the value of theta true. I'm going to compare a measured value with that value, and from that, I'm going to determine whether or not, overall, the universe has a positive curvature, negative curvature, or a zero curvature. What would gravitational curvature look like? Well, it's pretty simple. If I imagine this picture in three dimensions, so imagine that I'm sitting here and I see, looking at a star, and there's some big object that comes, or like a black hole, or a quasar that comes between myself and that object, what I'll see is a ring. Because I'll see light that comes at me from above, and below, and then around the side. So I'll see a ring. And that's exactly what you see here. So these are, these rings are because of the fact that there's some object where there's a large gravitational well in between myself and whatever is behind it that I'm, that I'm looking at. You may have heard recently that, let's see, yeah. You may have heard recently that there were these observations of um, these distant supernova. So this is a supernova that was observed in 1964. This was a supernova that was observed in 1995. Uh, this is a supernova that was observed this year. This supernova will be observed in the next few years. They're all exactly the same supernova. It's all the same event. The only thing that's different is the trajectory that light has taken to get to us. So this is due essentially to the same mechanism that produced, if you like, this image, this gravitational lensing. It's essentially the same thing. So these, again, this is a very cogent example of the effect that gravity can have on changing the trajectory of, of light rays. Okay, so how do we determine, how do we determine the overall curvature? If we just saw pictures like that, we would determine that the universe is dominated by gravitational curvature. 
But what we're going to do is we're going to use a cosmic microwave background to tell us exactly what theta true is. If we know theta true, we can compare with the theta measured and derive what the overall curvature is of the universe. All right, the cosmic microwave background you know was discovered in New Jersey. Uh, I myself was born in, let's see, it was discovered here um, by these two guys. This is what physicists looked like in 1965. Uh, I myself was born in Newark, New Jersey, about a block from where this picture was taken. Um, well, it's not a very pretty picture, I guess. Uh, and the discovery of the cosmic microwave background is accredited to these guys, Penzias and Wilson. But in fact, the cosmic microwave background had actually been discovered 25 years before. They just didn't realize it. So in 1940, this guy, Andrew McKellar, who was a Canadian physicist, was looking at um, light coming from uh, some distant source, and what he observed was this uh, rotational line from, um, from the CN molecule. So there's a carbon and nitrogen molecule uh, put together, and they rotate. And they have different rotational modes, and there's a transition from the J equal one mode to the J equal zero mode. And he saw this very curious line and didn't understand why it was so big. We now understand that it was so big because the, this excitation is being driven by the CMB. So the energy of this line exactly corresponds to 2.7 degrees Kelvin. So this line had been seen in 1940. People did not understand exactly what it meant. In um, 1950, there's, a, and of course, this 1940 was the time of the Second World War, so this went largely ignored. Ten years later, Hoyle makes mention of this line, and Hoyle realized, everybody realized, lots of people realized that there should be some residual radiation left over from the Big Bang, but he did not believe that it was due to the Big Bang because he thought that the temperature of the CMB should be about 11 degrees Kelvin right now. In fact, there was a wide difference in the opinion of physicists at the time. Uh, Alpha and Herman thought that the temperature of the, big, of this, of the cosmic microwave background should be 1K or 5K. They had two possible solutions. Gamow wrote up that the temperature should be 50K. So there wasn't universal agreement. Um, in 1946, uh, Dickey did a very clever experiment where he looked at the sky temperature as a function of uh, elevation distance. And he tried to look for unaccounted extra contributions to the sky temperature. And if he had done it more carefully, he would have come up with an unaccounted for, unexplained contribution of 3 degrees Kelvin, but he didn't realize it at the time. He only put a limit of 20 degrees Kelvin. And that's why um, these guys, who of course were totally unaware of this previous history, well, what they did have was they had a very precise measurement device. And only because they had a precise measurement device were they able to make the, make the measurement. Okay. Um, all right. Okay, so the question is, how do, we, how do we determine the overall curvature? And again, what we're going to do is we're going to use the fact that the cosmic microwave background gives us a value for theta true. If we had two stars, let's imagine that there's, so here's, here's our visible universe. Here's our visible universe. Here we are. Let's suppose there are two stars. And let's suppose that 
we know a priori what the angular separation is between these two stars. And then we measure what angular separation we measure. We, that we measure the actual um, separations that we see. Well, again, if it appears that the two stars are here and here, then we know that the curvature of the intervening space is dominated by gravity, positive curvature. If it appears that the stars are here, then we know that the intervening space is dominated by dark energy curvature, the opposite curvature, negative curvature. But how do we know what the true angular space is? Well, take a graduate student, send him into a rocket ship, and we can't do that. What we do is, again, we use the cosmic microwave background. And how do we do that? Well, what we know is that in the early universe, in the early universe, we have this quote unquote fluid, and the fluid consists of several things. It consists of protons and neutrons and dark matter and electrons and photons. And what we'll do is we'll imagine, for instance, for the moment, that we're going to focus in on three contributions. So out of that, there are three, three pieces that are important. Dark matter, protons, and photons. Now, dark matter, of course, only feels the gravitational force. Protons are charged, so they will interact with photons. I'm going to get essentially the equivalent of uh, Compton scattering. So I'm going to get this. Um, I'm going to get this constant interaction between protons and photons. And what I'll do is I'll imagine that. So here's a little potential energy curve. And at the bottom of the potential energy curve, I have lots of dark matter. And in addition, I have photons. So I have gammas, and I have protons. Now, the photons and the protons are coupled to each other by the electromagnetic interaction. If I had, if there were no other effects happening, then all of the photons and protons and dark matter would just sit in this region of high gravitational curvature. So if there are no other effects, all that would happen is that photons, protons, and dark matter would sit at the bottom of this little, this little bubble. And this little bubble, I'll say, is essentially as big at any time as my visible universe. So I, this bubble is getting bigger with time. Now, however, as photons and protons and dark matter particles, as they cluster, I have an additional effect, which is the photons are going to get hot just by PV equals MKT. So PV equals MKT, the density goes up and the temperature goes up. The pressure goes up. So now I have radiation pressure, which is going to push the photons outwards. In addition, there is electrical repulsion between the protons so there's two things that are affecting, three things affecting the protons. The first is dark matter is pulling them into this well. The second is that their interactions with other protons are causing them to repel. And the third is that their coupling to photons is essentially dragging them along with the photons. Okay, so there are three competing effects. The first is that there is gravitational force. gravitational force, which of course is only, effect, uh, only felt by dark matter particles. That is, oh, sorry, dark matter only feels the gravitational force, but clearly all the other particles feel this as well. There's the electrical force, 
and that causes proton-proton repulsion. And then there is radiation pressure. And the radiation pressure is, again, a reflection of the fact that as the photons fall in into this well, they get hot, and then they, uh, and then they, as they get hot, they produce these little acoustic waves that push outwards. Now, these three, obviously the effect of these three, the magnitude of these three contributions, depend on the amount of dark matter that I have. It depends on the ratio of protons to dark matter, as well as the ratio of photons to dark matter. And all of these forces are at work at the same time. So what will happen is, just like an ordinary potential well, I'm going to get resonance effects. And I'm going to get special or eigen modes inside this well. There will be essentially oscillations. Now, the, so, all, so all, this, all these objects, they're all oscillating back and forth. But some of the oscillation modes have bigger amplitude than others. So which have the biggest amplitude? It's, it depends on the size of the event horizon. So this bubble, if you like, is the size of my visible universe at any given time. So the amplitude which is biggest corresponds to the amplitude which has a wavelength equal to the size of the cosmic horizon at any time. So what that means is that as time goes on, the biggest amplitude will also, or that the largest wavelength amplitude will also change. So imagine, for instance, let's suppose I have this bottle, and I blow into it, and when I blow into it, I'm going to drive the system with a range of different frequencies, a range of different wavelengths, but there's only one that has a very large, well, there's a fundamental that has a large amplitude, and that fundamental that has the largest amplitude corresponds my little bottle to the case where uh, lambda over 4 is equal to L. There's another, there's another mode. The other mode corresponds to 3 lambda over 4 equals L. If I change the length of the bottle, if I take out some water, then L changes and my resonant wavelength changes. And it's very similar in the early universe. As the visible universe gets bigger and bigger, the resonant wavelength is just following the size of the visible universe. OK, so if I know how big the universe is at one particular time, I can predict what the fundamental wavelength will be. And I know, I know how to do that, because I know that there's a special time, and that special time happens, remember that the photons and the protons are coupled. There's still electrons here. But there's a special time, remember that as the bubble gets bigger, the temperature is going down. Finally, I cross a threshold where the temperature is less than 13.4 electron volts. Well, that's not exactly the right value, but I, I find that the universe gets big enough so that the temperature is less than 13.4 electron volts. At that time, something special happens. At that time, the protons and the electrons form hydrogen, and the, and the photons decouple from their interactions with the protons. So all I have to do is figure out how big the universe is 
at the time when the temperature was 13.4 electron volts, and now I know exactly what the scale is of the largest amplitude oscillation in the universe at that time. That's the trick. How do I do that? Well, it's pretty simple. I, I measure the temperature of the, the microwave background today, it's 2.7 degrees Kelvin. To get to 13.4 electron volts, all I do is I just use KT equals 13.4 electron volts. I figure out what the temperature is, and then I can just work my way backwards, figure out, I can figure out what the temperature is that corresponds to proton electron combination of hydrogen. The ratio of the current temperature to that hotter temperature is roughly the ratio of the current scale of the universe to the scale of the universe at the time of so-called decoupling. Now, the time, so when the universe, when the universe went through this process called decoupling, I know that there was, for instance, a hot region in the center, again by P equals RT, the photons here are hot, and the photons that have crawled out of the well are cold. So, if I were to ask, what is the angular scale between hot and cold in my little bubble? It's very simple, it's 180 degrees between here and there. As time goes on, and now these photons freeze free. So each one of these bubbles, that's what I'm trying to show here, each one of these bubbles essentially represents the CMB picture at the time of decoupling. Here's my visible universe. It's hot in the middle and it's cold at the end. As time goes on, what happens? And again, I figured out exactly what the scale is, 180 degrees. So let's suppose, for instance, let's suppose I were to ask the question, what is the angular scale that I expect for angles between hot and cold in the sky today. Well, that angular scale, theta, and this is theta true, because I know exactly the physics that's driving these acoustical op op oscillations. Theta true is just equal to 180 degrees divided by something like P13.6 electron volts divided by 2.7 degrees in Kelvin. Something like that. Sorry, there's 2.6. So, and again, at decoupling, the angular scale is 180 degrees. Why does this angular scale change? Because as time goes on, I start to see more and more bubbles. My visible universe is getting bigger and bigger. And, let's see. Right, so as time goes on, my visible universe is getting bigger and bigger. And now I can see the hot and cold regions in the next bubble over, because all the photons are now free streaming towards me. So now I can see, so this corresponds, for instance, to the case where the temperature of the universe was half the temperature for formation of hydrogen, and so on and so forth. That is to say, as I go on, so here's what I start with, here's hot and cold and cold, and now there's another hot, cold, hot, etc. here and here, and as time goes on, my visible universe is getting bigger and bigger. So I start to see another hot region here. And now my angular scale, instead of being 180 degrees, is 45 degrees. And as my visible universe gets bigger and bigger, I now see more and more of these hot and cold regions. Okay, and the trick is that we know exactly what theta true is. So we can predict a priori what value of theta we should observe if the universe is 
flat. And then we go ahead and we do the experiment. And this is what the this is what the boomerang experiment did. Let's see. Right. So this is what the boomerang. So the boomerang experiment in 2003 was the first experiment to actually do this in a very precise way. Uh, what they do is they use these things called bolometers. And bolometers are just these solid state devices which are cooled down with liquid helium to a temperature which is near zero. At those temperatures, the specific heat becomes very, very large. So these bolometers become very sensitive to small changes in temperature, mainly due to uh, CMB radiation. So they can detect something like millikelvin and less temperature changes. All right, and they operated at three different, uh, three different frequencies, and they have uh, multiple pixels, and that way they get a view of the sky. Okay, and again, this, is, this illustrates what they were looking for. So, we know what the, we know what the true angular scale should be for zero curvature between hot and cold regions in the sky. This is the picture they should have seen for the case where the overall curvature is zero. And you can see what the average, average angular scale is between hot and cold. It actually corresponds to about one degree, which is about the same angular scale as the sun or the moon. This is the picture that they would have seen if the universe is dominated by positive curvature, gravitational curvature. And here the angular scale is much larger, as I illustrated earlier. Here, the angular scale is smaller. So they measure one of these three pictures. They compare it with the picture they know is the case for zero curvature, and they just figure out which one is right. So these are the three possibilities. And in fact, what they measure is something that looks like something that looks like this. Okay, this is another way of saying this. So again, this is zero curvature, this is positive curvature, this, the separation gets bigger, and this is negative curvature, the separation gets smaller. And again, what we know is that the true theta is about one degree. Okay, this is all contained in the, so this is, for instance, uh, WMAP data, which is much more precise, and here we have a full sky map. This has been replaced now by the Planck mission, and the big punchline, of course, is this graph. So here is the power spectrum of what we measure. So what you do is you take that graph and you just do a spherical harmonic decomposition. And you see the frequency of two uh, points in the sky that have a difference of one degree versus two degrees, and so on and so forth. And what I'll remind you, very importantly, is that there are three effects that are at work, three forces that are at work. Dominantly, the gravitational force and the radiation pressure. When the gravitational force, and they are not necessarily in phase, when gravity is in phase with radiation, then we get the biggest amplitude. And that corresponds to this peak. And the angular separation here, again, exactly corresponds to what we know to be. It, this measured value corresponds to the true. I'll also mention that, of course, there are smaller, um, smaller peaks, and the smaller peaks result from the fact that gravity is not necessarily in phase with radiation pressure. So I can have a anti-harmonic, for instance. It's also interesting to note that, as in the example with the bottle, if I know what the fundamental is, and the fundamental is at a multiple moment of about 180, I can predict that the next mode will have a value of 3 times 180. And in fact, that's pretty much what you see. It's at about 540. So the, even though this analogy is very crude, it in fact is 
is fairly apt, and so on and so forth. This would be something like 5 lambda over 4. So all of this information, more complicatedly, is encoded in this... You better turn. Uh, all right, yeah. All this information, the baryon density, the, uh, the total density, which includes both baryons and dark matter, all this information is encoded in this in this spectrum, which is why it got it gets so much so much attention. Okay, long story short, um, the universe is, as far as we can tell, overall flat. Now, two more comments. The first is that these photons that reach us don't entirely quote unquote free stream. There is an effect which is called the Sunyayev's Zelfovich effect, which you're probably familiar with. And the Sunyayev's Zelfovich effect results from the fact that these photons can interact with electrons along the way between the production point and where we are here. It will actually, it's essentially inverse Compton scattering, and it will raise the temperature of the CMB a little bit. The second thing is that you can also measure the polarization of the, um, of the CMB, and that's shown in this very famous map of uh, the, bicep, the bicep experiment. Gravitational perturbations, gravitational waves running through the early universe will produce so-called E modes as well as B modes. So E modes are, as the name suggests, these are divergent only, and B modes are rotational. And you look at this map, and clearly there are large patches of rotational, you know, you can just, with your eye, you can see rotational patterns, which indicate a large contribution from these B modes, and is what got so much attention. Um, ultimately, of course, it was, so people looked at this map, which is a map of the polarization of the cosmic ray background, and concluded that they were seeing evidence for gravitational waves at a level that was much bigger than anybody expected. Ultimately, it was realized that, um, that much of what they were seeing was the result of scattering off of interstellar, was scattering off of dust, unfortunately. There's a funny, um, I'll tell you a funny story about this. Well, it's funny for me, it be funny for you. But the person who was the leader of this experiment was a guy named John Kovacs at Harvard. And um, he worked in the, uh, the same building as I did. Um, our labs were in the same building. Of course, I didn't have such an illustrious experiment as he did. And he's a very competitive guy. And every year at the South Pole, there is this race, it's called the Race Around the World. And remember, I told you there's that little South Pole. Well, every year on New Year's Eve, they have a race that goes around the South Pole, and therefore, you're literally running around the world. And it's about a three kilometer run. Well, it's kind of hard, because you're up at two kilometers elevation, and it's about minus 40 degrees centigrade. And nobody really takes it seriously, but the first year that I was down there, I thought, yeah, I'll run this race. And you get a t-shirt. I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll run this race. And everybody lines up, and nobody really runs very fast, except for this one guy, John Kovacs, who had all his running gear out, and he suddenly took off and bolted out. And I guess his competitive nature, uh, you know, he shows his competitive nature in running. And I guess maybe here this is the work of their group. And it's very, you know, it's a very careful group. But, um, but ultimately, I, I guess within the last six months, they had to uh, withdraw this, this result. So that's my... Let's see. That's, okay, yeah. That's my 
crash course on the cosmic background. Again, I, I realize that this is probably all very familiar to you, and you've seen this a jillion times already. Um, but nevertheless, it's such a big part, and it's such an interesting story that, um, that I thought I would review it. Um, so tomorrow, I'll, I'll actually talk about uh, something closer to what, what I'm involved with, which is um, particle astrophysics. Um, at the South Pole, and we'll go on to some of the experiments that actually measure cosmic rays. Was that, was that, am I, was I speaking too fast today? It's okay. Okay, good. Okay, so tomorrow, um, we'll talk more about uh, particle astrophysics. Okay. Thank you.